Good morning everyone. We have come to the second case of our round table discussion. A woman with walking difficulty. Myself, Premali Jayasekara, physician, Dr. Darshan Sirisena, neurologist, Dr. Mundominda Munidasa, rheumatologist, will be discussing this case. A 54-year-old woman presented with constitutional symptoms for three months and she had acute onset burning pain in lower limbs, numbness of both feet a month ago and there was progressive difficulty in walking. There were no backache, no other systemic symptoms. When we look at the past history, she had a pulmonary TB at the age of 18 years, an episodic short of breath for three years, no history of cough or wheeze, no diurnal or seasonal variation. She was treated as late onset asthma with inhaled corticosteroids. She was self-medicating with theophylline and Montelukast as well. She had recent exacerbation three months back requiring oral prednisolone. And further, she had allergic conjunctivitis for three years, three episodes of acute suppurative otitis media and hypertension for last three months and she had hypothyroidism for five years. So we'll go to the examination. She's an average built woman with no significant lymphadenopathy, no skin rashes, no evidence of arthritis. Blood pressure was 140 by 90. Respiratory system, there's a bibasal end inspiratory crepitations, no ronchi. Abdomen, no organomegaly. Central nervous system, cranial nerves were normal, upper limb examination was normal. In lower limb examination, she had bilateral high stepping gait, left more than right. When you look at this chart, you can see the left side is more affected than right. There's a zero power of ankle dorsiflexion, extensor halysis longus, ankle plantar flexion, ankle eversion, inversion in left side, but ankle dorsiflexion and extensor halysis longus, grade 4 power in right side. And she had absent ankle jerk on left side and sensory loss of L4, 5 and S1, right side L4 and L5. Back examination was normal. So with this, the problem identified was woman with walking difficulty having sensory motor deficits in both lower limbs. I would like to ask Dr. Darshan Sirisena neurologist to evaluate this problem. Over to you, Darshan. Thank you, Primali, for the presentation of the history and the examination. So, this is a 54 year old lady with a lot of comorbidities in the background, presenting with a neurological problem which is difficult in walking, and the examination findings are confined to the lower limbs. So when it comes to the neurological aspect of this, my priority when examining this patient is to, be, is to come for a neurological diagnosis. So when you, ex, when you go through the history and examination, the salient features in this patient is it's an acute onset, painful, progressive over one month and predominantly asymmetrical where the left side is more affected than the right, which is distal, flexid motor more than sensory weakness. So clinically which we call as a predominantly asymmetrical motor sense motor more than sensory lower motor neurotype of lesion. So when it comes to the such a neurological diagnosis the next next aspect would be to what side could be get affected. When it comes to the lower motor neuron type of lesion it could be a radiculopathy which is very a vague term very broader term I would say which involves the nerve roots at the level of the spinal cord which could be a compressive or non-compressive as you know or the next is the involvement of the peripheral nerves when it comes to the classification it could be a mononeuritis multiplex or a symmetrical peripheral neuropathy so as the the key features in a mononeuritis multiplex it's painful and asymmetric which our patient had whereas in the peripheral neuropathy is usually a symmetrical which pain may be there or usually it's a tingling or a burning sensation which did not fix into our patient's presentation. So therefore, this is a, so in that at this stage, so most important investigation I would like to consider in this patient would be the nerve, neurophysiological studies or which we named the nerve conduction studies coupled with the EMG. 
So what it will give? It will confirm our examination findings. At the same time, it give it gives some further evidence whether it's a demyelinating or axonal, which is very important in the management aspects and finding etiologies. And next time, depending on the nerve conduction findings, which we can further look forward for the other investigation. So what were the findings? So it showed or it confirmed our examination findings where it showed asymmetrical nature, sensory and motor involvement and other important thing is the axonal involvement. So it usually excludes the demyelinating pathologies, maybe the atypical guillain barre like picture or a CIDP and uh, it again it confirms the findings are due to the lower limbs which confirms our findings. Thirdly, it shows some sort of a uh, sheds light on some sort of side source which is post ganglion. So it's outside the spinal cord, it's outside the spinal cord which could be plexus. So the plexus is very unlikely in the clinical history and the proximal nerves which could be the peripheral nerves or a neuropathy or mononeuritis multiplex as I mentioned already. So what is mononeuritis multiplex? It's a painful asymmetrical asynchronous sensory and a motor peripheral neuropathy involving isolated damage to at least two separate nerve endings, nerve areas, sorry. The multiple nerves in random areas of the body can get affected as you very well know, which could be a patient could have a diabetic patient could have a six nerve palsy and later he could, should, could have a foot drop due to the common peroneal like they are two separate areas of the body. So, but the most important thing is when this mononeuritis multiplex evolves, especially at a rate as in our patient, it becomes less multifocal, therefore it becomes less asymmetrical or what we call as more symmetrical. So what are the causes? Common things are common, always consider diabetes, but in our patient it didn't give a clear history of such. So immune mediated pathologies has to be considered, what we call as it's a broader term as vasculitic neuropathies. Amyloidesis has to be considered when it comes to mononeuritis multiplex. In our patient, it's less likely because there was no clinical features in the history and examination such as such. Paraneoplastic always come to the, the picture, especially at elderly and other this, uh, rheumatological conditions like po polyarthritis, nodosa, rheumatoid, SLE and the idiopathy always has to be considered. So at this point, the most important investigation for me would be a biopsy. The commonest site to the biopsy is the sural nerve. So there is, which showed, and in fact in this patient, sural nerve showed evidence of uh, histological features suggestive of vasculitis. So, so it confirms, and so far this confirms the patient has a vasculitic neuropathy, more specifically it's a peripheral vasculitic neuropathy. So when it comes to diagnostic classification peri for peripheral vasculitic neuropathy, it could be two types. It could be a systemic or non-systemic. Systemic could be further subdivided to primary uh, systemic vascular neuropathy or secondary form. So what are the primary ones which you know which is the vast majority represent of the peripheral vascular neuropathies? The polyarthritis nodosa, the churg stroh syndrome, vaginous granulomatosis and microscopic those are the common. There are many in the list but I have listed the common ones only. All the connective tissue disorders right rheumatoid SLE comes to the secondary causes as well the Cryoglobulinemia is associated with hepatitis C infection and always paraneoplastic infection. So we we'll start with the investigation. Full blood count. She had low hemoglobin which was 10.3 which was slightly low and WBC of 9500 and 20% of eosinophils. Absolute eosinophil count was 1820. She had Blood picture showed moderate eosinophilia with mild iron deficiency anemia. ESR was 48. Her X-ray lumbar sacral spine was normal. And as she had nasal congestion and bit of a headache, we went ahead with CT brain. So it was normal except for ethmoid and maxillary sinusitis. Her ANA was positive, which was above 1 is to 80. P and C anchor were negative. This is a chest x-ray which has bilateral lower zone reticular nodular shadows with calcified lymph node which resembles old TB. This is a HRCT which has patchy ground glass opacities in subtural areas of lower lobes. So impression was chronic organizing pneumonia. 
you can see her lung function test. Diffusion capacity is low, which was 48. And FEV1 to FEC ratio is 110, compatible with restrictive lung disease. We went ahead with bronchoscopy and bowel studies, which were normal, and her sputum AFB three times negative, sputum for TBG and experts negative. As she had hypertension, we want to exclude any renal involvement, so we did UFR, which had 2 plus albumin, and RBC and CAS were nil. Urine protein creatinine ratio was 2, blood urea and creatinine was normal with normal ultrasound KUV. This is a renal biopsy which is favor of small vessel vasculitis. This slide shows the rest of the basic investigation with normal fasting blood sugar and echocardiogram was normal except grade 2 MR. The liver profile was normal. TSH was normal with serum ferritin of 300. In this point, I would like to explain about few investigation in small vessel vasculitis and chest X-ray finding. Usually, we see transient pulmonary infiltrates, and we can have peripheral patchy pulmonary opacities. And about 25% of people chest X-ray can be normal, and they can have extensive air space opacity when there is hemorrhage. And there can be pleural effusions, and rarely they can have large hyalur lymph nodes. An HRCT finding, our patient had ground glass opacity. Actually, it is the frequent feature which can be transient, often bilateral, and it can be symmetrical or patchy. And they can have traction bronchiectasis, honeycombing subpleural nodules, consolidations, and bronchiectasis, usually compatible with interstitial pneumonia. The lung function test shows restrictive lung disease with low diffusion capacity, and full blood count shows eosinophilia, which is about 1,500, and this particular lady has VC. And interestingly, revealing the history, this patient was self-medication with Montelukas. What is the significance? So eosinophilic granulomatosis is increasingly recognized in asthmatic patients who are on leukotriene antagonists, but they don't know the course exact mechanism is not known yet. So clinician to be vigilant in all patients who develop systemic symptoms when start treatment with leukotriene antagonists. With that, I would like to compile all the problems up to now, starting with painful asymmetrical sensory motor peripheral neuropathy of lower limbs, mononeuritis multiplex confirmed, sural nerve biopsy compatible with vasculitis, then preceding constitutional symptoms for three months, allergic conjunctivitis, recurrent otitis media, CT sinusitis. Lung disease with recent exacerbation and good response to steroid. HRCT shows chronic organizing pneumonia. And she had renal involvement with newly diagnosed hypertension, subnephrotic range, proteinuria, renal barply showing small vessel vasculitis, peripheral blood eosinophilia, ANCA negative but ANA positive. With this problem list, I would like to ask Dr. Dominda Bonidas, a rheumatologist, can we put all these problems under one umbrella? Over to you, Dr. Dominda. Thank you, Priyamali. Looking at this problem list with Priyamali presented to you, uh, it is obvious this patient is having a disease which has involved multiple systems. Specifically here, mainly the neuro neural system, the lungs and the kidneys. Whenever you are presented with a, such a patient, or you start taking your history and then examine and find that there are multiple systems involved in that patient, you should try to build up a differential diagnosis first and then work it out to find what exactly the cause. So generally how I look at 
these patients when they come with a multi system of course the autoimmune inflammatory conditions comes in the top the connective tissue diseases and different sort of vasculitis but we need to always think about the infections especially tuberculosis in this country the hiv as well as leptospirosis and even dengue can present with the multi system involvement neoplasms and peroneoplastic syndromes are also a common reason that we may see patients having a multiple systems involved this is like amyloidosis which cause infiltrative type of the changes in different organs is something always need to keep in our back of our mind so building up this differential diagnosis is through the history examination investigations using the history symptoms signs in examination investigation findings we try to build up a pattern of involvement of in our patients this pattern recognition especially very important in rheumatological diseases specifically in the connective tissue diseases and vasculitis which will tell us what most likely diagnosis but going not only the pattern recognition of this we always need to exclude the infections neoplasms and the diseases like uh, amyloidosis in this patient otherwise you may mislead into believing the patient is having something else so while the history like in our patient the history told us there is very likely the respiratory and uh, and the ne neural system is involved the examination gives us a clue that blood pressure is high since maybe renal is involved so that missing parts were added by use during the investigation so always when you plan out investigation in such a patient need to go through all the systems or do basic investigation to see if there is any of the other systems are involved then we need to do supportive investigations like auto antibodies in the uh, rheumatological diseases but of course remember the false positives can happen like in this patient the and the an is positive but certainly this patient is not showing any other feature to suggest that patient is having a sli so all ana positives does not mean that similarly in this patient is anka negative but still we ultimately come came to a diagnosis this is anka associated vasculitis because of the other features uh and also we may need to do investigation to exclude like i told you before the infections and neoplasms in most of these patients so what we are talking dealing here is with a patient with vasculitis and very likely it's a small vessel vasculitis when we name the vasculitic diseases we now use the 2000 uh 12 revised international chapel hill consensus conference nomenclature everybody i'm sure is very familiar with large vessel medium vessel and small vessel classification in addition to this main classification diseases we they have also included the variable vessel vasculitis single organ vasculitis vasculitis associated with systemic disease and vasculitis associated probable etiologies in this classification or in the in naming not it's not really classification it's the naming of these diseases when it come to the small vessel vasculitis we have immune complex small vessel vasculitis including uh, anti glomerular basement membrane disease as well as the anka associated small vessel vasculitis which we are inter interested in this patient so the anka associated small vessel vasculitis include microscopic polyangiitis granulomatosis with polyangiitis and eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis when we say anka associated vasculitis that is because of the anka is common uh, is found to be commonly in, uh, positive in this patient but 
looking at this, this picture, we'll find e even with GPA and MPA, 5 to 10 percent can be negative. EGP, especially 50 percent, can be negative anchor, but still we consider it as an anchor associated with vasculitis in this nomenclature. There are two varieties of anchor the C anchor, that is uh, proteinase 3 anchor, positive anchor, and myeloprex, this positive anchor, that is P anchor. And GP has commonly has PR3 anchor, while MPA has MPO anchor. EGP again, it's more commonly uh, MPO or myeloprectidase positive anchor. Remember, there are other diseases which can have anchor positivity, uh, like SLE. Now, the newer thinking or what people are trying to persuade others and to develop a newer nomenclature based on the features as well as how they respond to treatment they think it will be better to call them pr3 positive anchor associated vasculitis mpo positive anchor associated vasculitis and then egps anchor positive as egpa and anchor negative egpa this might be the future uh, this might be the future where different treatment plans will come up for this this type of grouping Although any tissue can be involved in anchor associated vasculitis, the upper and lower respiratory tract and kidneys are the most commonly and severely affected. In addition, that you will get the changes in the uh, nervous system, gastrointestinal system, and cardiac as well. Uh, this patient, you have noticed that with the high uh, in peripheral eosinophil count with the vasculitis we always take it as eosinophilic delimitus with polyangitis. There are different diagnostic and classification criteria developed starting about 40 years ago in 1984 the Langham diagnostic criteria which include three features which should be there for a diagnosis and our patient had all three. And also then later, the American College of Rheumatology made a classification criteria in 1990 where you had to have four out of six, and our patient also fulfilled this. But the newer trend in making classification or diagnostic criteria is by use giving weightage to each of the features, the positive and negative features to be used, a group of them to be used for the classification. This already have we have approved rheumatoid arthritis as well as a silly criteria, which has uh, gone into this change. So similarly, the uh, the diagnostic and classification criteria for vasculitis group, which is a worldwide group which has recruited a large number of vasculitis patients and analyzing each of the different diseases, are coming up with this classification criteria. The draft for the EGP at present in include this with the clinical and investigation criteria, giving positive and negative weightage marks and needing uh, more than six or more for the has to classify. If we put this into our patient also with the uh, uh, mononeuritis multiplex, Ilson field count uh, with a negative anchor, and uh, it's, we can still make the diagnosis of EGP in this our patient. EGP has classically has three phases of development. So it's developed very slowly over many decades in a patient. So they generally have this prodromal phase, may start in second or third decade of life, uh, uh, characterized by atypic, atopic disease, allergic rhinitis, and asthma, which our patient had for uh, many years. Then there is what we call eosinophilic phase, where you get either blood eosinophilia and the infiltration of organs with eosinophils. We have detected blood eosinophilia in this patient recently, but that may have been there for the last few months or so. Uh, 
uh, though we did biopsies we couldn't get any infiltration uh, evidence of infiltration infiltration with eosinophils but that's not essential to have that the then we the patient will get the vasculitic phase by developing either uh, the life threatening systemic vasculitis of medium and small vessels generally coming in the third or fourth decade of life the each associate vascular and extra vascular granulomatosis and may be heralded by non specific constituent symptoms as in our patient so different organs can get involved pulmonary neuro gi cardiac and renal when it come to treatment there are two modes of uh, guidelines which are available there is one which is specific for egpa as well as uh, the eula era and edta recommendation that is european league against rheumatology european renal association and uh, european the dialysis and transplant association which recommend uh, anchor associate vasculitis as one group a uh, treatment plan the egp specific one uh, used what we call five factor score looking at the severity so if any one of these are there they take this patient having a severe disease and people who have don't have any of the features are gone as non severe disease a different pathway of treatment so the age over 65 creatinine over 150 micromoles per liter cardiomyopathy gas gi involvement and absence of ent manifestations are taken and non severe where you can give corticosteroids and if with failure that you will use immunosuppressants in severe disease you use uh, corticosteroids with cyclophosphamide induction plus plasma exchange if there is a pneumorenal syndrome or uh, renal rapidly progressing renal disease or uh, lung hemorrhages then they can be maintained with is is uh, azathioprine and methotrexate and failures again will consider especially the new forms of treatment the biologics anti il5 and an anti ige which is not available in this country is developed and is available in european countries for use for this disease uh, what we have the b cell therapy rituximab also can, it will be an alternate treatment for failures when they you fail for the cyclosmide and corticosteroids when it come to anchor associated as a group all three diseases which are called anchor associated vasculitis we simplify by looking at again as not non organ threatening disease organ or life threatening disease or rapidly progressive renal or pulmonary renal failure or pulmonary hemorrhage the non organ threatening disease where the organs are involved but then they are not in a failure state you can use methotrexate or mycophenolate with steroids there is organ threatening the organ going into a failure or life threatening situation we will use cyclophosphamide or rituximab with steroids uh, especially if there is severe life threatening with the rpg and pulmonary hemorrhage may need to consider plasma exchange in addition to the cyclophosphamide or rituximab with the high dose steroids Uh, maintenance can again in this patient we manage with azathioprine or methotrexate that's the overall management plan in our patient because he doesn't have very severe life uh, organ failure type of involvement we have decided to treat with steroids plus mmf and she has done a, a good response to that uh, uh, so far so this brings us into the second case discussion in this round table case discussions in this program uh, together with priyamali darshana i would like to acknowledge and thank our patient for consenting to be discussed here all the consultants who contributed to establish the final diagnosis in this patient and dr tilini perera my senior registrar 
uh, to collecting all the necessary details of the patients and the documentation for this presentation. A special thanks goes to Sri Lanka Medical Association and Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine for the opportunity given. Thank you to all who have joined this session from three of us and we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, provide the time permits that. Thank you very much.